With the recent update, YouTube hide the dislike counter from the public. So, as a programmer, I decided to create a tool, which has nothing to do with the dislikes, but it solves a problem that is created by it, such as finding the high quality tutorial videos and hatred channeling toward the comment section. Like, imagine a situation where people watched a 10 minute long tutorial video, and it ended up being a total waste of time. Naturally, what they do is dislike and leave, because they know that it affects the public like and dislike ratio. So when somebody else came in and saw that ratio, they decide to stay or leave. But when you take away the public dislike counter, ratio is gone as well. Which means that people spend even more time to reflect their frustration in the comment section. And this brings us to our tool. See, when I heard that YouTube is removing the dislike counter, I thought, huh, that is pretty easy to recreate. Just fetch the data from the API and wrote the simple Chrome extension to put it back where it belongs. Well, things turn out that it is not that simple, because YouTube also removes the API access for dislike counts starting from the December 13th. So obviously I started looking for alternative solutions. Then I remembered the potential rage problem in the comment section and thought to myself, wouldn't it be amazing to extract emotions from the comments. Then I get to work and try to figure out how this can be done. After researching, I found out that using a technique called sentiment analysis would make sense. But what is it? Well, it is a subcategory of of natural language processing and its main goal is to extract emotion from text. At its core, it works by having a dictionary of words and each word has a score in range. For example, between minus 5 and 5 where the minus 5 meaning the absolute negativity and 5 means absolute positivity. The more you get closer to 0, words become much more neutral. So, in a sentence, we can just find individual scores of each word and take the comparative score. And finally, we can make assumptions about a sentence by putting our calculated number in range. However, keep in mind that this one is one of the most bare bones approaches. No machine learning or no AI or fancy stuff. As a result, this thing is not be able to fully detect the contents. Like, take a look at this example. Food is not that bad, which implies a neutral meaning. However, since it includes the word bad, it comes out like a negative sentence. It may seem like a big issue, but it is not in our case, because our project is mainly structured around technical videos. And generally, those videos don't contain a lot of sarcastic comments by their nature. So now, let's look at our project structure. Our project will be a simple Chrome extension because it is one of the easiest ways to interact with YouTube without actually using the API. It has three main parts, pop-up, content, and background. The pop-up is pretty simple. It is the menu that we see when we click on the extension icon. It is basically just a minified web page and this is where we display our information. Next up, we have a content. It is the current page content and we use this to access the current page elements. In our case, it is YouTube and we use this to grab the comments. Then finally, we have the background. This is basically where the business logic lies. We use this part to calculate the sentiment analysis score. Now, let's look at the data flow. So first, we go to our desired YouTube video and wait until at least first few comments load. Then, from our pop-up, we send message to our content script. And that fetches the comments from the video. And once that's done, it will send those comments to the, our background script. And there, the background script makes the analysis and pass back the results. After that, content script forwards this message to the pop-up and finally, we can display those results. It is all great until this point, but how do we actually make the analysis in the background? Obviously, we can write it ourselves, but that would take a bit of time. So, to deal with it, we take an advantage from a wizard named Browserify, which helps us to convert npm packages into code that we can execute on our extension. To do that, we first need a sentiment analysis package. And after two seconds of research, I found a package named sentiments. It is perfect for our use case and it's actually pretty simple to use. Now, let's bundle it. There, as you can see, we have this basic script. We just import the sentiment package, create a method named getAnalysis, then initialize the package and return the analysis result. We then export it as the get analysis score. And finally, we bundle it by using this command. At this point, we are ready to import this to our extension, which is this one. There, you can see we have few JavaScript files, including our bundle, two HTML files, and a JSON file. Now, let's quickly go over them. First, we need to have the manifest.json file. It is the core of any extension. 
In there, we basically specify the configuration of our extension. And this can include things like name, description, version, and so on. But most importantly, the script routing. There, on our background, we include an HTML file. And inside that, we include our background logic scripts and our bundle. Then, we define the page that we see when we click on the icon, which is popup.html. And finally, we add content script and permissions like so. However, this is not the main part that I want to show. The most important part is the data flow, which starts with our view in the popup.html file. There, we have few elements and styling. But most important thing here is the update button and the popup.js script which controls that button. So let's quickly open that up. There we have a bunch of data display configuration, but this is the part that we sent the update message. To where? To the content. There we grab the comments from our page and send this data to the background. There we make our analysis and send results back to the content. In the content script, our send message has a callback which grabs this data and send another response. And that response ended up in where we started, which is the pop-up script. And finally, we grab the data and display it. I know this is oversimplified explanation, but I will provide the GitHub repository in the comments down below, so you can play with it as well. Now let's head over to the GitHub repository and check out how we can install it on our browser. To do that, first we need to download the extension by clicking the code button and download zip. Once it's done, we can put it into somewhere we like, then extract it. Next up, we go to our browser, in this case, let's try Edge. To add our extension, we go over to the right corner and select extensions. However, if this option is not available for you, what you can do is pretty simple. Just go to the URL bar and type your browser name. Then type colon, slash slash, and extensions. And once you hit enter, you should see something similar to this window. There, we enable the developer mode, and we get some additional options. From those, we select load unpacked and choose our extracted folder, not the zip version. At this point, we are ready to use our extension. And using it is pretty simple. All we had to do is open up a YouTube video. Now, I've already opened up few videos, so let's see how our extension works. So first, we have a music video, which in many cases, the comments should be positive, right? Well, okay, anyway, we click on our extension and hit update. And there we have a score of 0.098 from 18 comments. So if I load more comments and try once again, there we go. Our score is now updated. Now, there is also a number in the dial, and that is our normalized score. The original score is in the bottom and it ranges between minus 5 and 5. But to increase its sensitivity, I have set its range between minus 1 and 1, and normalized it between 0 and 100. This helps a little bit, but realistically, our normalized score is fluctuating between 40 and 70%. So if the score is greater than 50, we can generally assume that the video is good to watch. To prove it, I've opened up a coding tutorial from Traversy Media, which has a lot of helpful tutorials. So if we calculate the score, it ended up being 60, which is pretty good. But if we load all of the comments, as you can see, it raised all the way up to 71%, which is a strong indicator that this video is actually good. To try the exact opposite, Let's open up the YouTube Rewind from 2018. And if we calculate it again, we obviously got a lower score. However, it is not as low as it should be if we keep the dislikes in mind. So this shows us a weak side of our program. If the video is not technical by its nature, then it doesn't work as expected, because it doesn't understand things like memes, sarcasm, and so on. Like there, I have two great examples, one from Lemino, and another one is from Veritasium, which both channels are absolutely amazing. But when I try to calculate their scores, they are not as high as they should be, because the comments are mainly focused around the video topic instead of the video itself. So this actually shows us that it applies for both ways, positively and negatively. So in the end, why I showed you all of this? Well, this video is not about judging the YouTube and its decisions. 
it is just about taking a different approach to solve problems. In that case, the problem is not necessarily about the dislike button, but finding good instructional videos. I know the solution that I came up with is not great. It has terrible code quality, not working consistently, and will probably never be used. But the idea and basic implementation is there. So if anyone gets inspired by my video and took it a step further, we will be getting closer to the ultimate solution, which is my main goal to achieve by creating this video. So I hope you've enjoyed it and find it somewhat useful. And until next time, take care.